patient, if you're well educated, particularly on treating spinal disorders and, and know a little bit, I think you go in to see a physician um, with a little more education about the treatments and what's going to be done. Um, the main reason I, uh, I, I really try to pursue what I'm going to show you, which is minimally invasive spine surgery, is because I really had an interest in advancing the field of spinal surgery. And I recognized really a need for improving spine care. I think some of you uh, here might have had spine surgery in the past. May maybe the results of that spine surgery weren't optimal. And I felt, boy, there's a much better way to do this. I saw way too many spinal surgery patients in, in chronic pain disorders that were very difficult to treat. So um, I set out to, to maybe see if I could change the, the way we look at spine surgery patients and the way we treat them. Um, and so we're going to proceed with that. So low back pain, we've all probably had it. I know I've had it just after this weekend doing a little yard work. But it's, it's very common and it's one of the most common reasons for us to go to the emergency rooms. Um, it presents uh, with mul you know, multiple possible sources of uh, the pain that we're experiencing. But uh, interestingly, this is a kind of a dated article. It's over 10 years old. But back in 10 years ago, they were saying that in 85% of the cases, they didn't really know what caused back pain. Um, so being one of the most common reasons for patients presenting to the emergency room or seeking primary care treatment, it was very unusual to me that 85% of the time, people didn't know what was causing the low back pain. Well, if you look at modern medicine, this quote essentially says the foundation of clinical management involves the establishment of a diagnosis ideally at the time of the initial patient assessment or after appropriate investigation. So if you don't know what's causing the problem, how do you expect to get a proper treatment? And I think this has been a big problem and where patients are very confused and where you might be confused and maybe why you came here to try to find answers. I have low back pain, nobody can help me, please, what can I do? So, once again, exact cause cannot be made in 80% of cases. And I think if you ask a lot of spine surgeons what causes back pain, a lot of them and very educated individuals and experts in the field may say, well, in many cases we don't know. So I, I set out to try to answer some of these questions and this talk will delve into that. So, this is why you can go from one surgeon to the other and you get different treatments. Well, we need to fuse your entire lumbar spine. We need to put pedicle screws from top to bottom. We need to do front. We need to do side. We need to do back. And it's very confusing. And I think there's a better way to do this. So understanding the basic pathophysiology of low back pain may vastly improve patient outcomes. By the way, the direct cost, the direct not indirect cost of the care of lower back pain is extremely expensive. It's about $25 billion a year. So you can imagine if we can get this under control, we can actually reduce the cost of health care in general. A lot of, unfortunately, the mandates that are being passed, including Obamacare, is because legislators feel physicians can't control the cost of care. Well, we need to do it because you and I both want good quality care. We work very hard for it. We invest in this in our entire lives through the payments out of our paychecks. So heck, when I get to needing it, I want the best, okay? So determine the etiology of the patient's symptoms. Most patients will have multi-level radiographic findings. Well, if, what that means simply is that if you look at a MRI or an x-ray of an older individual, well, lo and behold, there'll be a lot of degenerated discs, there'll be a lot of collapsed discs, and based on our research, many times that doesn't result in any pain period. It is a natural aging of the spine, just like 
many of us losing hair, many of us getting wrinkles. It's not a problem. It is a natural aging process of the spine. So resist treating the x-ray. And I'll show you some classic examples of really bad looking x-rays where we found where the problem is, we treated the patient, and they're pain free. <clears throat> so determine the approach. This is very important from my standpoint as a surgeon. What's the best way, the, the least morbid, the, 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 the approach to the spine and doing the surgery that's going to result in the, the least complications for the patient when treating a particular spinal disorder. So what I'm saying comes off a wealth of clinical experience. And this is just an example through 2003 to 2011. We perform roughly, uh, myself as a surgeon, roughly 2,000 cases, the majority being in the lumbar spine, but the majority being done 90 plus percent in a minimally invasive fashion. And that's what we do day in and day out. That's what I was doing today. We operate through a little tube. And some surgeons, clinicians that are very experienced are amazed. Wait a minute, you can only treat a very small percentage of your patients through that tube because you can't see anything. Well, guess what? You got to do your homework ahead of time. You have to see, you have to talk to the patient, you have to look at the radiographs, you need to understand the pathophysiology of the spinal disorder in order to make a focused incision and work through the small tube because in the majority of cases the problem is just just needs an approach that is a couple inches in, 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 in length. Why is that important? Well it's very important most of your support of the spine is actually in the posterior musculature or the back muscles. So if you disrupt those and destroy those or injure those that results in additional problems. What's called iatrogenic means man-made injury to the muscles and we have many papers that have shown this and proven that this indeed happens. And this just shows an MRI. This is a patient with lumbar stenosis. You can see the nerves right here are pinched. I don't know if you can see that arrow but <clears throat> this is after a minimally invasive fusion. The muscles are very nice and pretty normal. The black is actually the artifact made by the screws that were put in there. So there, that's really just an artifact. But you can see with an open procedure, you see how the muscles are all whited? They're actually scarred in and injured significantly. And this has an impact on the patient. So this is lumbar stenosis. This is one of the most common things that we see our, 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 our spine patients suffering from. It occurs from the facets or the joints of the spine getting very big and the ligament of the spine getting very big and lo and behold we don't understand what causes this. So I'm going to show you what I think causes this condition. It results in neurogenic claudication. Some of you may have this problem. You can only walk maybe a hundred yards and then you got to sit down. And you got to sit down and usually lean over and when you lean over you get relief of the pain. That's because you're opening up that already very tight canal. Just a little bit, but enough to take a little bit of the pressure off the nerves, then you can get up and walk. You see it when you go to the grocery store and you lean on that cart. That's exactly what you're doing. You're opening up that canal where the nerves are and allowing a little more room so they, they can breathe or whatever and it takes the pain away. This is a minimally invasive laminectomy. So this is before surgery, a little image right down, if I can find my arrow, right here. And this is after surgery. We've gone right down. We've preserved all the muscles. We've freed them all up. And this is when we take out the tube, all those muscles come back together. So essentially, we're doing this procedure through essentially a, an inch, inch and a half incision. We're taking care of the problem, which is the pinching of the nerves and we're preserving all the muscles of the spine. That is very important and results in long-term improvement as opposed to taking down the traditional approach detaches all the muscles, takes off the lamina, the spinous process. That's not where the problem is. The problem is right here. So we've made basically an inch incision to treat that problem. 
This is an example of a patient that's gone under a open laminectomy. They've removed this part called the spinous process. It's all scar now. And lo and behold, two, three years later, what happens to the adjacent level? It starts to get stenosis. They didn't have stenosis initially when they did the surgery because they would have done this level as well. So what happens is they get an acquired stenosis above the level of surgery. And you all know Uncle Bill, who's had one surgery, two years later had a second surgery, three years later had a third surgery, and it creates a host of problems. That's not, in my opinion, what I want to go through as a patient, and I don't think it's a good thing. And in my opinion, the reason this happens is because we create a relative instability because we detach and we disturb the muscles that it puts stress on these facets. And we will show you our evidence for that. The facets now grow a lot bigger than they normally would because they're trying to hold the spine in place. And as they grow, as does what's called the ligamentum flavum, this black thing, it crowds the nerves and you get stenosis on the level above and you get a problem recurring again. So preserving those muscles prevents that problem. This is another example. This is a patient with an open laminectomy, had a stenosis. We came in, we did a two-level minimally invasive procedure. But the other thing we noted was that this is what's called a CT myelogram. They inject some dye. If you look at the nerve roots, this is where we did the minimally invasive laminectomy. The nerve roots are fairly normal in location. Where they did the open laminectomy, the nerve roots are clumped together. And this can create all kinds of problems. Another example, open surgery, muscles disrupted. There's a big cyst where it shouldn't be. This is because the muscles may not come together appro uh, appropriately. And you can see the nerves are a little bit fat, clumped together, kind of stuck together. This is the level above, kind of as a control, where you can see the normal distribution of the nerve roots. This is another example. This is an open laminectomy. You can see there's an absence of nerve roots here. The nerve roots are clumped together here where above, where they didn't do any surgery, you can see the nerve roots are normal in configuration. Well, why is this important? This is actually an intraoperative video of what the nerve roots look like under the dura. This was actually a person that needed uh, what's called a tethered uh, phylum terminale. I won't go into it. But the reason I show this video is you can see how delicate these nerve roots are. They're like little strands of linguine. Okay, and so they move when you move. So when you move, these nerve roots move. So it's very important that those nerve roots move adequately. So I came up with this theory. These open procedures can create a lot of blood and debris. That debris is then removed <clears throat> by a cell in your body called the fibroblast. They lay down scar. That scar can then stick those nerve roots together. Well, why is that important? Well, when you move and those nerve roots are stuck together, it's going to generate an action potential in the nerve root. And that action potential, in my opinion, can potentially be felt by the patient as back pain. And in my opinion, that may be a reason, this is just theoretical, but it may be a reason why patients having back surgery don't get better. Because the nerve roots, even though there's no pressure on the nerve roots, and there's nothing pinching on them, they're kind of stuck together. And that's a very difficult condition to treat. So, this is an open procedure. Removal of the, the, a lot of the bone that's not does not need to be removed. Nerve roots are kind of stuck together. Minimally invasive procedure. Normal muscle. Normal nerve roots. So that's what we're trying to go, that's what we're trying to achieve, just a, a, a magnification of that. You can see the normal muscles, the two little incisions that are made to do that procedure. The other results that we're seeing are results 
and hospital stays. This chart simply shows that those surgeons that perform minimally invasive spine surgery have, this is length of stay, length of stay, how long you're in the hospital for, have a much shorter length of stay. In fact, they have a shorter length of stay. The dark blue is the expected length of stay. So let's say for a lumbar laminectomy, a patient is expected to stay three days. Well, doing it minimally invasively, they can, the actual length of stay is lower than the expected length of stay. As a scientist, we, we like to do really confirm this scientifically, and we do research all the time. Uh, we actually, every patient uh, that I see, I try to get an outcome score and have the patient complete an outcome score on follow-up. And this is some of the results of that. So we looked at a long-term analysis of minimally invasive spinal fusion to see if it was actually helping our patients. This is over almost a seven year period of time and we're going to focus on what's called a minimally invasive transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion and all of you will know what that is once we're done. So this is one of the most common conditions that we treat. It's called spondylolisthesis where there's a little slip of one vertebrae on the other, primarily seen at the L4-5 level, this results, can result in severe stenosis. So there's two problems here. There's, there's a stenosis, which means the nerves are pinched, and there's a slip, which means that there's some kind of instability. And what we see in that slip many times is that the, the facets or the joints get very big, and that's what's causing the problem. And here's our solution. Here's a stenosis with a spondylolisthesis or a slip. We do a minimally invasive laminectomy to take the pressure off the nerves. And then we fuse those two vertebrae so the stability or it doesn't move as much so that we don't have the problem recur. So 318 patients averaged about 60 years old. But you can see from teenagers, 19 all the way up to 94 year olds, most with spondylolisthesis, some with degenerative disc disease, which means the disc is collapsed. And then we measured these outcome scores to look at them. And these are just a few of the patients. I don't think you need to listen to what these patients are saying. You just need to see their faces and know that these are very happy patients. Many of these patients have had back pain for 10 years, 20 years were scared to death to have surgery because they heard of nightmares and they saw colleagues and maybe family members that didn't have good results. And all these patients had really you know, excellent results back to their activities of normal daily living, many of them with complete resolution of back pain. And you know, for the funky looking x-ray, the patient with degenerative dexter scoliosis, you know, why does this patient have such a good outcome? This patient went back to work full time. Uh, she didn't retire um, and is very happy with the results of her surgery simply because we understood what was causing her problems and gave her focused care. In our analysis or looking at all these patients, the most common level treated was L4-5. So there is biomechanically something unique about the L4-5 level. They weren't all healthy patients. Many of them had high blood pressure, diabetes. A third of them, you can see, had diabetes, 23% uh, high cholesterol. So many of them had medical problems. You can see the distribution of, of the different medical problems. 5%, three major medical problems, 2%, 13, and one, one um, and eight, and almost 90% at least or 30% of patients at least had one major medical problem. So only about 50% of the patients were without a major medical problem. 50% went fusion at L4-5. Well, that's important for surgeons to understand because when they look at these patients, in half of them, L4-5 is the primary problem. And why is that? Well, it's fairly well known that that's the most common level fused, but if you look through the literature, most people don't know why. So we looked a little more closely at the literature, and it just so happened that that L4-5 segment was the most anterior. So the L4-5 segment 
is what gets the most stress. It's just like that tire on your car that gets the most wear. And so it's most, more likely to fail than any other tire. Why is the L4-5 segment the most likely to fail? Because it's the most anterior. And there's a part of the L4-5 segment, and you can't really see it well here, it's called the pars interarticularis that takes the most wear and is most likely to elongate or fracture. This is an example. This is the L4-5. There's the sacrum. There's L5. There's L4. L4-5, you can see that vertebrae is pushed a little bit forward. You have a direct line up here, and then there's a little step off. Okay, it's the most anterior. What that does is stresses the joints. This is the facet of the L4-5 segment, and they get fairly big, and when they start growing to try to hold the spine more stable, they crowd out the nerves. And you can see right here where the facets are very big. The adjacent segment, look at the facets. They're fairly normal in size. You see how these are gross and big? And that's the response of the body. So lo and behold, that's what causes the patient's problem. So that's the underlying cause. Here's a real obvious example. There's a slip at four or five. Look at the facets, they're huge. And when they get huge like that, they crowd out the nerves, pinch the nerves, and you feel it as back pain. Another example, there's a slip at four or five again. There's a fairly normal spine segment. You can see the normal facets. Look at how abnormal those facets are. So why is this important? It's important because it directs the surgeon where he should do his surgery. Once again, now I can focus on just that L4-5 segment. I don't have to put pedicle screws nilly-dilly up and down your entire spine, okay? Very important to understand that. In fact, we measured the facets, looked at films of all patients, measured the facets. There's a normal joint. This is like in your knee. Your knee has a joint, your elbow has a joint, your wrist has a joint. Well, there's your joint in your spine. Fairly normal looking joints. There's an abnormal looking joint. And when you look back at those abnormal joints, if you treat that level, if you fuse that level, those patients get better. Here's how we measured them. We measured them kind of longitudinally. The facets, there's kind of a, a, di, a, a, a model of what we're measuring. And this, so this adds some science to it. What we found was normal facets are smaller than abnormal facets. So you can use the anatomy of the facet to determine where the problem is. Why is that important for you? Well, that means your surgeon can look at the MRI before the surgery and say, bingo, that's where the problem is. Put a finger on it, okay? He treats it, you get better. And this just shows the ratio, facet ratios of normal and abnormal facets. And you can see the abnormal facets are clearly bi bigger. So the conclusion from this analysis was the facet anatomy, you can see postoperatively in an MRI or a CT, can determine where your problem is. Very important point. Gender also made a difference. When we looked at our patients, 60% of the patients that we treated surgically were females. And if you look through the literature, it's found that perhaps hormonal changes, menstruation, uh, what happens with oxy, uh, uh, oxytocin uh, in the female that's, of course, uh, pregnant and delivering, it loosens the ligaments. There's a potential of loosening of a ligament. And in the spine, there's ligaments around your facet joints. Potentially, that can loosen that. Potentially, that can lead to instability at a segment that's being stressed just like we talked about, the L4-5, potentially can lead to a slip. So I think this is why we see this problem more commonly in women than we do in men. Body mass index, well, what the heck is that? Well, that has to do with your weight. That has to do a measurement of body fat based on height and weight. So if you're short, really round, you're gonna have a large or a, a, uh, a high BMI or a body mass index, whereas if you're tall and lean, you're going to have a lower body mass index. And we found this is our distribution of body mass index. You can see most of our patients are on the heavy side. 
So spinal disorders potentially can be made worse by weight. And certainly we found smoking as well can affect. Lo and behold, at all body mass indexes that we measured, all of them, highest level of fusion was L4-5. So once again, the stress point, this just shows some of the numbers, L4-5 being the most common level fused. And you can see as you go up in body mass index, there's a high percentage of fusions that are occurring. So there are other studies that confirm this. Iowa study showed women have a higher incidence than men of requiring uh, spinal fusion. Uh, and also at the L4-5 level um, uh, has to do also with the alignment of the facet joint. So this just shows real quickly that the, the, all our patients, where they were fused. The, the real point of this, most of our patients only required a one level fusion and instrumentation to get a great outcome. Only about 10% or actually 3%, only 3% required more than one level fusion. That's great news for patients. And so understanding what causes a problem really makes a huge difference. I do very few. I can't even remember the last three level lumbar fusion I performed. That's a good thing for you as a patient. So here's an example. Here's a patient with a scoliosis. This patient, if they went to an, some surgeons, they would do a big reconstruction, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that would have made that patient any better. Understanding what I just explained to you, L4-5, looking at that, there's the problem when the slip occurs that there's a nerve right here. You can see on the level below where the slip is, that nerve is being completely squashed. So it's important in the method or the way we do the fusion, that we take the pressure off that nerve. And I'm going to show you how we do that. Spondylolisthesis, the nerve is getting squashed right in the hole here. That's called the neuroforamen. So restoring the height of the disc will open up the neuroforamen. And this patient gets immediate relief. It's kind of one of those ah moments. Take the pressure off the nerve, ah, that nerve feels a lot better. Now, why didn't we know this before? Because you got to look at the data. You have to critically analyze your patients. And that's why collecting outcomes before surgery and after surgery is very important. So here's our patient again, dextrous scoliosis. There's the slip. There's the pinched nerve root. Put that little device inside the disc, expand the height of the disc. We lock it in place with the screws. And you get that ah moment, that patient's pain is relieved. So how about the more complicated patients like this? And I'm sure this is kind of making you dizzy with all these pictures, but this patient had multi-level stenosis. Nerves are pinched here, nerves are pinched here. Nerves are really pinched at that level where that slip is. What level was it? L4-5, holy moly. And then we did a minimally invasive laminectomy, laminectomy, but at the level of the slip, we did a little more work. We put in that device that restores the height and lock it in place with the screws. And she's left with that little incision and she's doing great. Now, did we correct that curve? No, that wasn't where the problem was. Once again, understanding what's causing the patient's pain. Here's a guy with a stenosis here, stenosis here. He doesn't really have a slip. He doesn't have a slip of one, uh, vertebrae on the other. So all he needs is what we call is a minimally invasive laminectomy, much less of a procedure. And he did very well. Another example, stenosis, stenosis, stenosis with a slip. Once again, L4-5, minimally invasive laminectomy, just take the pressure off the nerves, pressure off the nerves. But at 4-5, we have to restore the disc height to take the pressure off of the nerves if they go through the neural foramen. Another excellent result. Lumbar stenosis, once again, at the level of the L4-5, the, the facets are very large. So at this level, we have to do a decompression, take the pressure off the nerve, restore the height and the alignment, lock it all in place, and that results in a great outcome. So how do we do a minimally invasive laminectomy? I know all of you are just dying to know the, how do we do this. 
So we approach the spine with a series of muscle dilators. We operate through a tube, and then we kind of cut the lamina. We then tilt the patient away from us, and we undercut this spinous process. So we don't take away this very critical anchoring of the spine where the muscles are attached. Once we do that, we then remove this ligament called the ligamentum flavum. Underneath right here are the nerves or the dura. We remove it first on the side of the surgeon, and then we remove it on the opposite side. Now, removing it on the opposite side is a little bit tricky. So we employ the use of a CO2 laser. This laser actually dissolves the ligamentum flavum and makes it a lot easier to remove. So it's a very nice technique. And we'll see right here, we'll get the ligamentum flavum in. Um, I just want to show you, see this is a laser. So this essentially a CO2 laser dissolves tissue. So that it makes it a lot easier. It dissolves that ligamentum flavum and it contracts it. And then after we've done that, we then take off the ligamentum flavum. Now I'm not going to advertise like that Tampa Laser Spine Institute um, that we use lasers and all this kind of stuff. Uh, this is simply another tool. Okay, and when patients come to me and they say, well, what about that Laser Spine Institute? You know, and I take out my Captain Kirk um, imitation and, and I say, well, I think in proper circumstances, the laser is effective, but don't get, don't get fooled by marketing gimmicks. This is not a marketing gimmick. This is simply another tool that we can use in the OR. And you can see we can remove that ligament and flavum very nicely and very safely. We've also developed special kinds of retractors that protect the dura or the nerves while we're working and it makes it a lot easier to do the surgery. And then this just shows before and after how we've opened up the canal and that we've left most of the bones and the muscles in place. Complication rates, we, that may seem high 12%, but that doesn't, that's actually very, these are common things that we see in all the patients. Urinary retention, particularly in older males. Um, atelectasis, anybody going under surgery gets that. We, really, we didn't have any neurologic injuries uh, in our series. Pneumonia, UTIs, these are very common things that we see in patients that are undergoing any kind of surgery. And we wanted to include everything. Um, fusion rates, extremely high. Over 95% uh, at our two year follow up. And the reason is because we use the patient's own bone in all our cases. We collect it with this little device called the bone back. This is simply when we drill, when we drill the bone, we simply collect that and we use it. And then we use it in our fusion. This is a fusion between of the facet to prevent any movement. We drill that facet and then we stuff that bone in there that we've collected and it fuses that segment of the spine very nicely. In this case, we don't even do instrumentation. This is the fusion or the bone bridging that we see when we put the bone inside the disc space. It just locks in there and it keeps the spine from movement. Once again, L4-5 level, abnormal movement. So when we fuse that segment, it stops the abnormal movement and prevents the stenosis or the problem from returning. Okay, and this just shows we've collected that bone graft material and we're going to shove it in shortly into that joint and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fuse that, that joint very nicely. So there's the joint. We're clearing it out and we're going to put that bone graft. Here's the dura. We've taken the pressure off of the dura and then we put that bone that we've collected using our bone back into that joint and it fuses. This is a really wonderful fusion because you've, you've, you've preserved all the muscles of the spine. So it's, very, it's a very solid structure um, and it fuses beautifully. It really uh, fuses very nicely. We don't have to detach all the muscles from the spine to do this very nicely. All through that little tube. And then this is what it looks like. There's the laminectomy pressure and there's the bone that's put in there and it'll reform the lamina, fuse the joint very nicely and we've seen that in many post-operative images. And there's the fusion that we achieve into the disc space and you can see the fusion across there where the canal, where all the nerves was, stays nice and open. 
really a nice thing. It's also cost saving. And Al Gore likes it because it's green technology. But it saves a lot of money. A lot of these other graft substances have complications associated with it, particular BMP. Uh, and so this saves a lot of cost. And this just shows how much we collect, about 10 cc's per level. Uh, Reoperation rate, this is great news for patients, 2% over seven years. That's a very low rate of reoperation. And we feel it's because we don't disrupt the muscles and the abnormal anatomy of the spine. Looking at outcome scores, these are visual analog scores. This is, you mark a one to 10, how bad is your pain? Most patients, severe pain is seven or above. So most patients, seven and above, and then you can see the drop off very quickly and sustained over five years. This is a more exacting outcome score called the Oswestry disability. It looks at your ability to function and also significant improvement in outcomes. The SF36s, both the mental and the physical, these are ways, these are objective ways to measure outcomes. The old ways used to be, oh, my patient's walking, he's doing great. And the surgeon would say that. So if you could walk into the office, you had a great outcome. That's not a great outcome. A great outcome is if you're back functioning, doing your activities that you want to do. And that's what these outcome measures critically uh, measure. So the long-term outcomes of these surgeries are very good and sustainable. Now, technically, this is where you might get a little bored, but there's many ways to do a, a fusion. This is an expandable device. We had some issues with that. This is another one that's not FDA approved, um, and it has issues in really putting enough bone into the disc space. This is what most surgeons use. They get a cage, they fill it with bone. In this case, this is the bone that we've harvested from the surgical incision. And then they kind of try to stuff it in there. And it's a real tight fit. And oftentimes, they end up injuring a nerve root. Patient wakes up with a numb leg or, you know, the leg, the foot doesn't work properly. And they're forcing it in there. And many times, it's not the, the, the appropriate height implant. So those implants can also back out uh, because go in, come out. Uh, once the patient walks. So we are working with companies to develop systems that are a lot easier to use and user friendly. And essentially, I use this slide to say, well, to surgeons, you don't have to go down the double black diamond when you're learning these techniques. Using these different tools will take you down the intermediate. And this is one of them. This is an implant that comes in on its side, so it's much easier. You can see it right here. This is the nerve that we're retracting. We're then putting this implant in, and because it goes in on its side, it's a lot easier to put into the disc space. Once we get it into the disc space, we check with an x-ray that it's appropriately in, we then turn it, and it restores the height of the disc. That's important for you as a patient, because when you restore the height of the disc, you restore the hole where that nerve was pinched. You remember the ah moment I talked to you about? And it's, it's much easier to put in. So this basically is a video showing how this thing goes in. We then turn it, we restore the height of the disc. It actually helps to restore the alignment of the disc very nicely. And this just shows intraoperatively what it looks like as well. Then we inject the bone that we collected. You remember from that bone back? We inject it, and that's your own bone. This bone is labeled with barium, and you can see how nicely it fills the disc space. We then detach the handle, and boom. That implant is left in there to keep the height of the disc. The bone is left in, in, in place. And this just shows an example. This is a very active 79-year-old. I don't know if you can see, but she has a real bad, almost a grade two slip right here. There's her slip. She also had really bad stenosis here at the level above at L4-5, at 5-1, the level below. Once again, those nerves are being pinched, so we have to restore the height of the disc to take the pressure off the nerves. And this is how we do it. We also developed this retractor to get down to the spine. 
So this is essentially bloodless. This retractor essentially comes, these are the intraoperative x-rays. You can see it's closed and then I just turn it and it like corkscrews right through the muscle. So it doesn't dis disrupt the muscles, it doesn't tear them off the spine. It just kind of goes right between the muscle fibers. We then get down to the spine, we open it up, and then we pass that little tube over it, and that's what we operate through. It literally takes five minutes, there's absolutely no blood loss. Very nice way to approach the spine. And this is how it looks. So we come down to the spine, we open it up, we pass the retractor over the spine, and then we operate through that. Literally five minutes, bloodless, does not disrupt the muscles. Then we do our laminectomy, we take the pressure off the spine. We're now going to the L5 level, that's where the slip is. That's where the vertebrae are slipped one on the other. We go down to the spine, open up the retractor, put our tube, we get into that collapsed disc space. It's very important to restore the height of the disc space because the problem is right here, the nerves are being pinched. We put our little device in there, position it, turn it, restores the height of the disc, and then we inject that bone that we collected and detach it, and this is what it looks like. There's an example, there's an example, and there's what it looks like through the microscope. So here, collapsed disc, nerve was being pinched, restore the disc height, take the pressure off the nerve, and this is what it looks like. We then inject the bone. This is a front view called an AP view of the spine. There's the vertebrae. It's right in the middle where it should be. Now, we have to lock it all in place because we want that bone to heal. And we do this with what we call percutaneous pedicle screws. These screws will lock everything in place. We've designed this arm to make it easier and safer to do. That arm holds this little what's called the jam sheeting needle in place. And this just shows that radiation exposure during these procedures to both the surgeon and the patient is significant. These are some of the studies that we've done and that have been published in the literature. So we design this simple thing. It's a little arm that we just kind of hold the little needle in. We just put that thing right down like that. It holds that needle. We then position it in place. And this shows how it works. This is fluoroscopy, so we use it to target the, the pedicles so we can put the screws in. I stand away. I can do the x-ray and not expose myself. And it also reduces the x-ray time as well. It increases the accuracy so the patient is exposed to less radiation. Very user-friendly, easy to use, so I don't have to hold this thing and try to you know, hold it like that and close my eyes or whatever needs to be done. Makes the procedure a lot safer and, and user friendly. And then these are the screws after they're in. There's that inner body. Uh oh. Don't. And you can see we don't have much to aim at. There's the pedicles. You can see how small the pedicles are. There, there is no room for error here. So this technology very simply makes it a lot easier and a lot safer for the patient uh, to make sure that screw is right down the middle. This was actually a patient with a curvature of the spine. There's another example. And there's before with the slip and after restoring the height of the disc, moving the vertebrae back very nicely. And this patient basically discharged post-operative day two. Now remember, this is a 79-year-old. And she's back to work in a week. Now, I will say, this doesn't happen with everybody, okay? She's a very active individual, but we certainly can do it using these techniques. Another example, really, this is an open uh, laminectomy. You can see how much scar there is. Tremendous scar. How do you figure out where this patient's problem is? Well, look at L4-5 first, right? So we did a flexion extension, and you can see, you can't see it here, but we do a flexion extension. This vertebrae goes straight, goes forward, and that's where the problem was. So the problem is right here. We don't need to fuse his entire spine. There's the nerve getting pinched once again. In the, in the dorsal root ganglia, the, it's normal foramen above and below. It's getting pinched right there, four or five. So we're now approaching it. We're using that one-step dilator, the tube, operating through the tube, putting that little device in there, 
And when we put that little device in there, it's easier to put in, even with a lot of scar tissue. This was designed, actually by me, to make it easier to do this procedure and safer to do this procedure. It then restores the height of the disc, and then we can put these little bullets with your own bone in and inject them, and they fill the disc space with the patient's own bone. Very important in the treatment of this problem. And you can see that disc space getting filled with the patient's own bone. We then detach that in there and it's left in place. Why? Because we were seeing too many patients, I was seeing too many patients getting nerve root injury with doing that little inner body procedure I just showed you. So we work very closely with our industry leaders to, to develop technology that's a lot safer. We mix it sometimes with bone graft material and that simply shows what we do. Another example, the, the device sits itself nicely in the middle. That's using those arms once again. This is how we percutaneously target those pedicles I talked to you about. And then we can take that gray two, that vertebrae is slipped way forward and make it completely normal. And this guy was crying the day after surgery because he didn't have the leg pain that he had for so many years before surgery. That's because we understood where the problem was. Then we lock it all in place and these are his post-op images. You can see the alignment is completely normal now. Another shot of that. And there's the incision. One inch incision. There's the incision from his other surgery. What I call a big whack. Another example of a patient more complex with spina bifida. There's the problem, compression of the nerve roots the series of steps that we go in to put the inner body in and after and the post-op images. Uh, a different case, a 91-year-old female with chronic back pain. You can see the slip once again at 4 or 5. She has a bad looking spine, but don't treat the x-ray. She has severe stenosis at multiple levels showing this. There's the problem. Part of the problem is the slip at that 4-5. Once again, restoring the, the, the disc height. This is restoring the disc height. Um, we did a minimally invasive laminectomy at, a, at the levels that didn't need that restoration of disc height. There's at the level 4-5, and there's the incisions, and that's it. Another case, a 70-year-old, severe dexter scoliosis. If this 70 year old would go to many surgeons, they probably would have put in 20, 30, a lot of screws, okay? That wasn't the problem. The problem, you can see her spine is completely curved, was actually, you can see it right here. She had severe stenosis at this one level, three, four. So we did this procedure. We did a minimally invasive laminectomy where we go in through a tube we take off some of the bone. This shows taking the bone. This is the nerves right here, okay? That was where the compression was. That was the main cause of her symptomatology. We made sure that we got plenty of room in there. We then put the bone on the side, just like I showed you, the, her own bone on the side. And then we did what's called a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation because of the scoliosis, just to give her a little more strength. So there's before. And there's after. You can see the way we went. Opened up where the nerves were being pinched. And then we did percutaneous pedicle screws. There's her incisions. And a few months after this surgery, she went to Europe on vacation. So this really works. We don't want to treat the x-ray. We want to find out where the problem is. 84-year-old, three-year-old with a severe scoliosis. This patient had undergone multiple back surgeries. And this is where your Sherlock Holmes hat comes in. Well, what's the problem? She was turned away, nothing else we can do. But if you look carefully right here, this vertebrae is way back. She's got a retro um, right here on the CT. You can see air in the disc space in many of these patients indicates where the problem is. And so approaching the spine, she had all this mess in the back of her spine, multiple posterior surgery, we actually went from the side. This is a very nice procedure. We avoid all the back prior scar and everything like that. We go from the side. We end up in what's called the retroperitoneal space right here as this illustration shows. And we go down through this muscle called the psoas muscle. 
to approach the spine in a different direction. And this is what it looks like. And then we put this cage in there. What that cage helped to do was restore the alignment of the spine, but more importantly, open up the hole where that nerve was coming out. That was the source of her pain. The neural foramen was getting pinched. And these are the after surgery images with that implant in there and uh, restoring the hole where the nerve comes out called the neural foramen. And there, there she was. And she, she had uh, immediate relief of her pain. So the talk is really to focus on preserving the normal anatomy of the spine. But more importantly, understanding the cause of the lower back pain. What's causing your ailment? If you have one blocked coronary, do you remove the whole heart? No. You unblock that one blood vessel in the heart that's causing the problem, okay? We need to do the same. So the Mackinac Bridge was just an example of that preserving the posterior muscles just like those tension cables on the bridge. If you cut the tension cables on the Mackinac Bridge, there'd probably be a lot of unhappy drivers. Uh, so there's the preservation of the normal anatomy of the spine. So what's the future? Is this the future? Well, we're working on technology that actually uses a combination of biologics, namely stem cells, in combination with devices. And although this is not available now, maybe in my lifetime it'll be out. But we're currently working on new technologies to actually restore the disc architecture or the disc itself, so we don't have to even do a fusion uh, using uh, stem cell based uh, technology. So that's, that's what we are hoping is on the horizon. Uh oh, I'm getting that little whirly thing. Oh, there we go. So um, this is what we hope to achieve in the future. We, re we get a collapsed degenerated disc and with a combination of a device that restores the actual anatomy of the disc, we then inject the biologics or the stem cells to restore the actual disc itself. So if any of you have about 10 or 20 million dollars laying around, let me know and that will go a long way in bringing this technology to the, um, to the marketplace. We also have a fellowship that if you know anybody uh, uh, that wants to participate both in clinical and basic science. We also have an organization called the Minimally Invasive Neurosurgical Society in which we try to teach surgeons how to do these techniques uh, and I think that's very important because when I need it it's very hard for me to operate using mirrors so I'm hoping that some people learn so if I ever need surgery I can go to them and then we have a great learning lab here at Beaumont which you know you if there's any donors here even a few dollars uh, for donations would help us in making that even better and of course, we have our Minimally Invasive Neurosurgical Society meeting. This is an annual meeting. We talk about minimally invasive spine, like I just talked about now. Also, minimally invasive cranial procedures to improve patient outcomes. And if you really have a lot of energy, you can get this textbook. Just uh, Google my name or just look up Quality Medical Publishing. It will show a lot of the techniques that I just showed you today. Uh, so if you want to bring it into your surgeon and say, read this before you operate on me, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. The pathophysiology of individual patients' back pain really can offer highly cost-effective surgical care. Thank you very much. I'm wondering about the uh, damage that we're doing to our nerves yeah. by staying in this pinched condition and not having it dealt with. So, you know, I get this question all the time. Doctor, if I don't treat this surgery uh, surgically, or, or um, what will happen? Um, hard question to answer, except for the natural history of a condition like spinal stenosis. So if you have severe stenosis, and if you're ever interested, go to any of the nursing homes in Houston, or excuse me, in, in, in this area. And, and you'll see patients with untreated spinal stenosis. What essentially happens is the nerves eventually give out. You go from walking to requiring a cane, to requiring a walker, to requiring a wheelchair, because you just can't walk anymore. 
And the longer you wait, the harder it is to reverse the problem. Um, I recently had to treat an unfortunate individual that had severe stenosis in the neck. And even though the nerves are freed, the spinal cord is freed, there is a, 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 a vicious cycle that goes on and he's gradually, he's becoming paralyzed. And there's nothing, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's unfortunate there's not a whole lot we can offer. So, you know, if you have a severe stenosis in particular, it's best to treat it when you're walking independently and not wait until you're requiring a cane uh, or a walker because then the, rever the reversing it is, is a lot harder and, and you may not reverse it. I've been told that I um, would have a um, surgical procedure done just to scrape the canal because of the stenosis that's in the canal. But if a surgeon was to go in there and proceed to do this, and then also see that I need rods. Would he do that immediately uh, in seeing that when he gets in, or will I know ahead of time that he's going to use rods? Well, it depends on the condition. Uh, and, and like I tried to show you, you know, we're finding that most patients only need one level instrumentation in most cases. Um, it really depends on, on what your problem is. And, it, it, you know, there's not a clear answer to that. It, it depends on if there's significant movement. The flexion extension is a very easy exam to do. It's a, an x-ray where you bend forward, get an x-ray, go backwards, get an x-ray, to see if there's any abnormal movement. The facets that I talked about are also an indication of abnormal movement. The, the slide that I showed is very hard for the layman, even surgeons, to understand this talk. Because a lot of what I'm presenting is, is very novel and new to them. And they, they have a hard time comprehending it. Um, but that's the, the facets themselves can tell me whether you need an instrumented fusion or not. So what I just showed you really... I think is a very important talk. Do you do this facet uh, examination at that time? We, we have, of course, you'll bring an MRI usually, and that's where we can look at the facets. I just have like a severe tired feeling when I uh, walk or I stand quite a bit. And that is typically, typical of lumbar stenosis. It's almost like we've evolved so that the body recognizes that lumbar stenosis is such a common thing that a lot of people don't have back pain with lumbar stenosis. Where they have pain is with standing and with walking. When you stand, that ligament that you saw we remove in the surgical slides with the laser, that buckles and that reduces the, the amount of space for the nerves and that's why you probably get the pain. Yes, sir. Is there any therapy I could take rather than surgery? We always do therapy first on most individuals, unless they're really in severe pain. Well, the, the course is usually I do a course of physical therapy, four to six weeks. Then I, that, that includes core muscle strengthening, massage, ultrasound. If that doesn't work, then maybe we'll try facet injections and see if that works. I've been in this long enough to be able to look at some images and say, you know what, you can do therapy, you can do injections, but you're probably not going to get any relief, or the relief will be very short term. And, and, and because it's a structural problem. It's essentially a vice is on your nerves. And you can massage or whatever all you want, but you actually have to take the vice off the nerves. I'm sorry? Probably because of my age. Right. The other thing with these procedures that's so neat for a particularly, this is, uh, if you look at our numbers, most of these pay average was 63 years old, but most are in their 70s, even 80s. This is a disease of aging. And so this is why I always kind of, you know, trick my patients to say, look, be careful about these healthcare systems that are being shoved down your throat. We want good technology and technique when you're old enough to require it, you paid for it into it your whole life. It's called the Medicare system. 
You deserve to have this. We are finding pushback from insurers that say, well, I don't know we, we're going to allow this. As patients and as Americans, we pay into this. So we need to be able to get this technology. And this is expensive. This is expensive to develop. It's, you know, a, a screw system, just the screws alone are typically about five to $10,000. That's a lot of money. Just the screws alone, okay? So that's where our paying into the system and working our butts off our entire life. We need to get that back when we need it. And unfortunately, Many of these patients are elderly. Many of them are paying for these procedures with Medicare dollars. I do have a diagnosis of uh, spinal stenosis. Um, I recently had, after five years of treatment at the pain clinic, I recently had an RFA. Would, is that, would that be a hindrance to... Okay. What's an RFA? An RFA is a radio frequency ablation. Correct. So, I just thought uh, I wanted you to tell people what it was. But um, so basically, what they do is they burn the medial branch that goes to the facet. So the idea is that that's causing the pain. I'm not a big fan of RFAs, although I have seen some patients get relief. In my experience, maybe, did you get any relief? About two days. Two days of relief. That's, to me, not relief. That's called anesthetic. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a great procedure. So um, I, I personally, uh, I don't really have a lot of my patients do that one. If one has degenerative arthritis and the second one is, does, would it help with that? The second question is, does Blue Cross Blue Shield cover that? What? <laughs> Your procedure. Yes, it does. You know, and, and this these are these are really traditional fusion procedures that are performed in a way that's less um, intrusive. And actually, you know, the the Blue Cross and Blue Shield loves this particular um, procedure because they're seeing it's helping their patients. We actually sat down with them recently because they they ruled that lateral approach that I showed you at the end was experimental. And so we went to the Blue Cross Blue Shield headquarters in the Renaissance Center, which is downtown, and uh, they, they recognize that the T-Lift, this procedure, is not experimental. It works, and they see it in their, in their, in their patients. Um, where we're seeing some of the kickback are individual insurance carriers that will say, well, this patient doesn't really qualify for a fusion. I'm like, well, what's your experience? And they're not even doctors. So uh, so, um, you know, that's, that's where we have to be careful as, as, a, as, a, as, as Americans. I think if you look at the numbers, everybody freaks out. They go, oh my gosh, there's millions of patients with back pain. This is going to bankrupt the, the economy. Well, the fact is we're spending a lot of money on this. These treating patients and treating them effectively is actually going to lower the cost of care. Many of these patients, including the one with the RFA, have spent probably tens of thousands of dollars of Medicare dollars on multiple rehab sessions, multiple this. You can identify, if you can identify the problems like I showed you, you can treat these patients, they don't need more rehab. They don't need the injections. All that, done. And the patient's a lot happier. Isn't that what we're trying to do? So very important. Somebody I here, I, this I got one more here. question here. here. Oh, okay, degenerative arthritis. I hear that term thrown around all the time. Well, my doctor says I had degenerative arthritis. I think that's a lack of understanding what is actually going on. Arthritis is a, is, is a, is a systemic problem. It means that it's all over the body. Okay? All you got to do is look at your knuckles. Most people's knuckles will show you if you have severe degenerative arthritis. If you ever look at an arthritis patient, they're all kind of crooked and so forth. I do not think this is an arthritic problem. This is another problem. There's another example why we really don't, many physicians don't understand the problem. If it was an arthritic problem, all the facets would be affected, not just one.
My question to you is whether or not after you do your surgeries, how long are you on pain medication and what type of pain medication do you prescribe for a length of time, let's say, of four or five years? Well, everybody's different. You know, everybody's different. I mean, you know, it, it's, it depends if the patient's been on pain treatment or pain medications for even a month before surgery, it's a lot harder to get them off of pain medication. So everybody is different. In general, on average, I don't like to give oral pain meds for more than two or three weeks after surgery. I just think that pain meds are just to get you through the surgery and then you're done. Rehab, physical therapy, things like that, maybe injections, but, but uh, we, we really try to get our patients off pain medications as, as quickly as possible. In this intra, in the hospital, I usually put them on a pain pump, unless they're over 80, then you gotta be very careful with pain pumps because they can make a patient stop breathing. But in general, they manage them with pain pumps. If it's a fusion, if it's a non-fusion, usually, IV morphine or sub-Q morphine, and then, and then pain pills. But we really try to wean them off that. Those pain, and if you're on Vicodin for more than a month, that's a problem. That's, unfortunately, you develop a dependence, and those patients don't realize they're doing themselves more harm than not. It's, it's a real problem, but everybody's different. There are some patients that, unfortunately, with those stuck nerves together, they've had multiple spines, sometimes you gotta keep them on chronic pain meds. I personally don't like to manage those patients. They go to the pain medication guy and he continues them on and he has to follow them very closely when they're on those narcotics. Mm -hmm.